Selling your business is more of a process than a one-time event. It is estimated that 30% of businesses that hit the market actually sell. We wonder why is that? Why do so many businesses that get listed for sale not successfully exit? And we believe it's because business owners are committing a few errors and making a few mistakes. Today, we're gonna to talk about those critical mistakes. I'm joined by my guest, Dave Levinsky, the managing partner, co-founder, president, growth bank, and GT Securities. Dave, welcome to the show. Appreciate it, Tim. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So there's never been a time like we see now where the baby boomers and mass, who in many cases own the large majority of wealth in America, are seeking their exits. They're starting to consider retirement. What does it look like for me? How do I get out? When is the right time? What happens to my employees? What happens to my kids that work in the business? And it's unfortunate that so many folks hit the market and don't successfully cash out. And today I thought we would talk about some of those, those mistakes. So if we're just kind of taking it from the top, I know you and I were talking a little bit about this concept of being irreplaceable to the business. What, what do you see in that regard? Yeah, it's probably the number one reason why a lot of these businesses don't sell is that the owner uh, is not replaceable. And what I mean by replaceable is you take the business and if you remove the owner, is the business going to thrive or is it even going to survive? And that's the issue. There are so many times that the owner is the only glue holding the business together, that the owner is the key co key contact with some key clients, uh, you know, key customers and without, and the owner runs everything and the business is in the owner's head and there are no real systems laid out. And that's, that's the key problem is that the owner, if, if he or she has not done so already, has to spend time to become irreplaceable. What does that mean? They need to hand over a lot of the relationships that they have with, with clients or vendors to other people on their team. They need to train people on their team. They need to create systems. So getting the information out of their head and onto paper so other people can, can follow it. And one of the key things to, to test whether your business is, whether you're irreplaceable or not, is to take a month vacation. <laughs> you know, take off for a month and, and do a, a, a mock selling of the business. And can you do that? Will the business do well in your absence? And if not, you need to go through these, these things and say, what do I need to put in place that, so that I am replaceable? And the good thing is that when you are replaceable and you could take vacations and work less, then maybe you don't want to sell right away, or maybe you can be more patient. And that, yeah. that's, that's key. People are always like, well, is now the best time to sell? Well, who knows? But it's always, you know, if you want to sell, now is a good time because things could get worse, things could get better. Nobody knows. And so if you're irreplaceable, you have timing and you put the business on for sale. If you don't get the right price, you don't really care so much because you're not working 60 hours a week and stressing because you're irre you're replaceable now and you have other people running the business for you and you could relax a little bit. That, that's such a great point. And I love the example of taking a test month off because yeah. you will absolutely see where the holes are. I mean, chances are many business owners have an idea of where the holes are, but you're not really mm -hmm. going to know until you stress test it. I, I think that's so great. Exactly. And when you think about the buyers, like what, it, what is it that the buyers want? I mean, a lot of times there will be an earnout scenario, which we'll probably talk a little bit about where, where they're going to expect potentially the owner to stay in it for a little bit, but they don't want them to stay in there indefinitely. What is the buyer's expectation of irreplaceability? Yeah, the buyer wants to be able to buy the business and have it run seamlessly without the current owner. And yes, sometimes there's an earnout period or, or time period where the owner is going to stay on and, and start training some new people. And that's fine. They want that as quickly as possible for the business to run seamlessly without the old owner and to allow the business to grow. And that's why they're buying this asset. When you're buying a business, a lot of most most often it's a build or buy decision. Do we want to buy this business or do we want to build something similar to that business? And you want them to say, hey, building something similar is going to take much more money, years, et cetera. You want to buy this thing because it is has all the attributes you want and it's going to seamlessly run as part of your business and you don't need the old owner in that business holding you hostage. So let's go a little more specific into this because I love the idea of irreplaceability. There's a business owner out there listening to this and they're trying right. to assess if they are irreplaceable or not, what what cues should they be looking for? What, what should they be paying attention to? Well, I mean, there, there's there's two core sides of the business in general. There's there's a sales mm -hmm. and there's internal operation. And so what happens to both 
if you were out of the picture as the owner? Are you the one securing new clients? Right. Well, that's, right. that's a bit of a red flag to say, if, if you're the only one that can do it, then how is the business going to succeed without you? So are, are you securing new clients? Are you doing all the sales calls? Are you maintaining relationships with, with key clients who might leave if you leave? Those are very big concerns on the, on the sales and, and the marketing and sales side. And then the operations side is how involved in, are you in operations? You know, can things progress and run without you? Or does everything go through you? But the employees constantly ask you questions and ask you for answers. And if that's the case, then that's, that's, that's problematic. And yeah. so you need to just think about like, what is going on on a daily basis? Are you answering a hundred emails? or hundred phone calls. And if you weren't there, who could answer those? Or could you create systems where the employees answer them themselves? Yeah. So either, either somebody else doing it or some systems in place that you do not have to be the, that central focus point of answering questions or resolving problems. That's what you need to sit, take care of. So you've seen thousands and thousands of businesses in your 25 plus years doing this. Do you think that the business owners are truly so important to the business or do you think it's their ego that's important to the business there? They're so tied up with the emotions of being in the business that they actually think they're more important to the business than maybe they are? No, I, I, I think I think it's the, <laughs> the former. It's not quite 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 the ego. I, I don't I don't think in, in general. I think a lot of them want to get out of the day to day. Yeah. Uh, and, and we talk, you know, like working you know, in the business versus working on the business. And we want to move towards that working on the business where the business can run without you. That's yeah. the key. The business has to be able to run without you. And then you work on the business, say, okay, be really more strategic mm -hmm. and not, you know, and get out of the constantly fight, fighting fires and answering questions and solving problems mode and get more strategic and say, okay, hey, I have this business. We're doing X. How do we go to 2X? What yeah. do we need to do? How can we, can we, you know, go into new markets, launch new products, services, et cetera. What do we need to do? So it's really too many business owners are too much in the business, in the weeds. And I understand you have to be there for a lot of businesses because that's that's how you start the business. That's how you learn. That's how you grow. The concern, though, is that a lot of times business owners are in the weeds because they don't want to hire somebody because it hurts their profitability. Right. And I get that. But if you can hire, you know, I always think of, of tasks the business owner does. If you're doing, you know, the $10 an hour task that you can outsource to a, ver a VA overseas, then that's not what you should be doing because you can definitely be making more than $10 an hour doing higher level working on the business tasks. So you really need to think about how do I delegate a lot of these tasks to somebody else? How do I train people? How do I build systems so that I'm not required on this day-to-day -day basis? 100%. So let's assume there's a business owner out there that is, you know, at that spot where they say, for the most part, I have removed myself from the day to day. I have good systems. I have good management. Um, I'm feeling pretty good about the state of affairs. And I do think I'm in a great spot to start getting out the door. Awesome. We, we talk to them all the time. Yeah. Um, we were talking about the negotiation process. When you start getting into the market, you start talking to buyers. What is one of the critical mistakes folks make when they're out there talking to buyers or looking for buyers or, and they start getting into that early negotiation process? The biggest thing is you don't want to be negotiating with just one buyer. Mm -hmm. like anything else, you need to create a marketplace. So Tim, if you have a business and let's say the true value is $5 million and I'm just the one buyer. Hey, Tim, I think it's worth $2 million. And you can't, right. it's hard to negotiate with just me. The best negotiation is say, hey, I appreciate you're willing to pay $2 million but I have three other businesses willing to pay $6 million. Are you in or out? Mm -hmm. and, and, oh, actually I am in. And it's because, you know, you need to create a marketplace where you have multiple people bidding for it. It's just like selling a house. In certain markets, there's just one potential buyer. And you're like, oh no, I have to take this deal, which is yeah. below market. And be, or I got to, or I got, or I can't sell the house. And yeah. other markets you have, you know, the asking price is whatever it is. And you have, three or five different people, buyers that are interested and it raises the price. And so it doesn't mean that the house is any better. It just means you've created a competitive marketplace. And as a result, the price has gone up and you as the business owner or homeowner benefit. And so that's the key. So the biggest mistake is creating a process where you're just speaking with one buyer. That's why it's really important to figure out how to get as many potential buyers to the table as possible. So you create that bidding war and increase the asking price.
And that's so a great that that is such a great point of negotiating with just one buyer because you have limited leverage with just one person. Exactly. You have no <laughs> leverage. You have, you have no leverage. leverage. <laughs> right. yeah, exactly. Yeah, especially if you're looking to get out. So uh, I like this concept of creating a marketplace. It's actually a really good visual as well. How does someone protect themselves when they're creating this marketplace? I, I know that's one of the questions that we get a lot, which is how do I make sure my competitors don't know I'm on the marketplace or. Sure. What should I be careful of? What are the landlines? What are the critical mistakes that I should look out for when, when I'm trying to create a marketplace? Sure. Well, this one is my answer is going to be a little self-serving, which okay. is that you really need a professional advisor. Yeah. Um, because it's it's really impossible to as you know I'm, I'm I'm Dave from Dave's Plumbing Supply Company and to try to market my business myself and do it blindly so people don't know. I'm marketing Dave's plumbing supply company. It's virtually impossible. But if you get a professional services firm, a third-party firm that can go out and, and create a list of, hey, here's a hundred potential buyers for this business. And to each one say, hey, I have a plumbing supply company that is located in you know this state, you know, and so so some vague term terms or general terms that's doing this much in revenue that's poised for this type of growth. Are you interested? And so we call it a blind teaser which is you tease them, give them some top line information, blind being that you're not mentioning the company and you're trying so they try to make it so they can't guess who it is. Yes, if someone's an industry insider and they look really hard, they'll know. But the point is the professional service, service firm is not going to be pitching your close competitors in most, most cases. So they're not going to know. So basically getting a professional for services firm that can figure out who are the right potential buyers, creating a big enough list so that we can create a competitive marketplace and pitching a blind teaser to say, would you be interested in this type of business? And then getting those businesses interested, getting them to sign a non-disclosure before revealing your information so it doesn't become the talk of the town. And then you have only interested buyers that have signed non-disclosure agreements looking at the details of your deal. Yeah, it, it goes back to that real estate example where you can do it for sale by owner. But what do you know about real estate? And what do you know about negotiating deals if you're you yeah. know, an obvious and hiring a professional services firm like Growth Inc. If you're looking to sell, call us. Mm -hmm. uh, hiring a professional services firm. We've seen this time and time and time again. How would a business start to assess like th this person might be better for me versus that person? I think a lot of it is how you feel. You're talking to somebody. Do you, do you feel that they are trustworthy and yeah. they're, they're going to do, do a good job? You know, certain things like, hey, this this firm has a lot of experience in this industry. I don't, I don't love those things because a lot of times when you're in the industry, you're like, okay, I know a couple of buyers, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna go after the usual suspects. And if you're outside the industry, sometimes you think a little bit diff differently. And finding the usual suspects is easy. Hey, I'm gonna find the usual suspects, and I'm gonna find some private equity firms and some other firms that the industry insiders wouldn't even thought about. Because that's not what they do. They're so stuck in their ways of this is the industry. And someone that could think of, hey, this company, this large corporation outside the industry might be really interested in getting in this industry and they haven't been and they will pay a huge premium. That's when you start getting a lot of money. That's a big difference between the, you know, for sale by by owner example in home. Yes, you're saving the six percent fees or whatever the fees are of an owner, but you're, you know, in this case, you know, but you're saving the fees and you're, the price is usually not going to be that much higher in a home. Here, you're talking about a business that could be worth, you know, we've seen businesses that people value at a million dollars, the same business valued at $3 million and $6 million. It's like huge differences based on who the potential buyer is and what marketplace. So we're talking about multiples of EBITDA, of revenue differences that the business could be sold for if you get the right buyer. So I think that going only people that know your industry is a mistake. I think you want to go with somebody that is that you feel good with and someone that's aggressive like mm -hmm. usually like i don't like people cold calling me and saying hey we you know offering services or emailing me to me it's, it's almost a little bit, bit obnoxious but on the other hand like certain things like selling a business or different sales things i like when somebody pitches me on hey we're going to get you you know on sales stuff hey we're going to get you you know 20 prospects for whatever product or service you're selling because they're reaching out to me that means they, they're they're preaching they're showing what they're doing. They're aggressive. And so you need somebody that's aggressive. That's the, that's the big thing. You want somebody that's going to hustle for you. And that's why it's so important that they take a percentage of the deal. Because if, if, they're, if you're giving them a fixed fee, then they have no incentive to increase the, the price of the deal. 
And so if you want someone that's really aggressive, that's going to take a percentage as a success fee, and it's in their interest. If they sell it for $5 million, they make X dollars. But if they sell it for $8 million, they make so much more money. They're on your side. You want somebody that is going to be your wingman, your partner that is has skin in the game as well. And that's how you, you find a really good uh, professional services firm, in my opinion. I love that answer. I love the aggressive answer. You know why? Because no one talks about getting someone on their team that is aggressive. We always talk about other things like, you know, do you have a good synergy with them? Are they relatable? But at the end of the day, they are a hired sales rep that's going out into the field to sell your potentially your most important asset, the thing that you spent your entire life building. Yes. You want to maximize this value. And if you get someone who's potentially a little too passive or stuck to the old ways of doing things, uh, you might waste a lot of time, correct? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it goes back to like, do you want someone that's done a hundred deals and then you're just another deal? Yeah. I want somebody that is going to just be with me 24 seven and just fight for me and work their tail off to yeah. get the best possible deal. I want, so aggressiveness to me is, is probably the number one thing. I love it. Um, okay. So let's assume that we have our business owner and they're fully optimized and standardized and remove themselves from the day to day. They have a, uh, they have a good professional service provider who's working with them, a banker. They had the hired growth Inc. Let's talk a little bit about deal economics, deal structure. You know, there, there's mistakes around not being willing to sh look at different deal structures and mm -hmm. maybe being so just bought in that it has to be a certain way. Like I just need a big check. Mm -hmm. Let, let's talk about the mistakes around that. Sure. So yes, I want a big check. I'm selling my business. It would be ideal if you give me a big check. And so let's say my price is $10 million. Yes, give me a $10 million check. I'll walk away. A lot of times that doesn't happen. A lot of times there's going to be an earnout. I'm going to give you 5 million now, 5 million potentially over time. So there's lots of ways that deals are structured. And a lot of it is to minimize the risk of the acquiring firm, right? They don't want to take the risk paying $10 million for the company and the company doesn't pan out as expected. So they want to minimize that risk. So a lot of times the business owner, you're going to have to consider that. And you're going to say, hey, I'm not going to get the deal structured the exact way I want. So now you got to consider different things. So one deal term could be maybe they're willing to give you the $10 million check, but they're going to give you a large, a long-term uh, non-compete agreement. So you can't go back in the business. Now, that's what we need to be aware of because a lot of times business owners, after a year or two, they say, wow, I'm sort of bored. You know, I want to get involved in something. I can just start a similar company. And I know multiple people mm. that have sold companies Got at, gotten out of the non-compete two years later, gone back to the same exact business, started a new company, grew that, sold the second company for even more money. And mm -hmm. because they know the business, they know they know exactly how to run the business. So one thing to be careful about is non-compete agreements. You don't want them to be too long. Just you want to preserve some flexibility in terms of what your future holds. Another thing is, you know, consider the earnout. Earnouts are okay if if a lot of the earnout is in your you have power over. So let's say the earnout is we're going to give you X dollars now, we're going to give you X dollars in the future based on revenue of your division of our company. Well, revenue, I feel pretty good about. Well, if they say earnings of your division, well, I have some concerns because let's say they put their, you know, they charge me for their accounting person, you know, $600,000 per year. So earnings concern me because now we're dealing with sort of net income and where we have expenses deducted out of it, like top line revenues. And if me and my sales team are controlling sales, we know the parent company wants sales to go up, then that's more in my control. I like that better. So if it's an earnout, you need to make sure the earnout metrics are ones that you can control mm -hmm. or have as much control on uh, uh, over as possible. Um, also deal terms, just think about a lot of times there are non-cash options, you know, non-cash um, earnings and say, hey, we're going to give you X dollars in cash and, you know, Y dollars in stock in our company, our stock options, whatever, whatever, however they structure it. So that's something that's very important to keep in mind as well. How how do you feel about this parent company, this, this new potential parent company? Do you feel that they are going to be successful? You know, is it a public company or, or is that, if it's a private company, is that stock ever going to be worth anything? Is it, is it ever going to be liquid? So there, those are the types of issues that you need to think about and say, hey, yes, maybe, um, you know, yes, I want the money in cash, but is there a non-compete? You know, is it better to take some of the money as stock options? And then you obviously, not obviously, but you may need to talk with a, a tax attorney or accountant about that because sometimes those options 
that are, are taxable today. Mm -hmm. So they may give you, so if you get $5 million in, in cash and $5 million in options, if you have to pay essentially taxes on $10 million, well, that's not cool. <laughs> so, right. you know, you, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta think about issues like that as well. You know, mo most business owners that have hit some level of success, they're really good at doing their business. They're, they're really good at building what they built. Maybe they're into software or they have a carpet cleaning business, you name it, maybe they built up a few million. They, they don't really know this space. It causes a bit of friction and anxiety for them when they start thinking, I just know my business and all this sounds fine and dandy. It sounds laborious. It sounds expensive. It sounds tedious. I'm not sure I can pull this off. What do you say to those folks? I'm a, you're right. Selling, yeah, selling your business is not fun. It is tedious. It's real work. It, it, it sucks. It sucks. That's what I say. You're right. You're a genius. You're exactly right. Uh, I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> that being said, as you mentioned, it's generally almost always the most valuable asset that they have yeah. and that they will ever have. And so that asset is worth nothing, zero, if you don't sell it. And too many times we've seen fire sales that the business owner gets in a car accident, has a stroke, so someone in their family gets cancer. They can't run, you know, it's like their spouse gets sick. It's like so many times. And this, this is not 5% of the time. It's not 50% of the time, but 20%. I mean, it's a real significant percentage that something goes wrong. Accidents happen, stuff happens, you know, and you are forced to sell. And if that, if it comes to that, then you get screwed because you're not going to sell for nearly as much money because you don't have time to make yourself irreplaceable, etc. So I tell them that, yes, you're right. Process isn't the greatest, but if you hand it off to a professional services firm, A, they're going to do all of the heavy lifting. So it's going to save you time. B, they're going to get you a much higher sales price. Mm -hmm. And so that number one asset that you own is worth a lot more money, et cetera. And while you're in the process, while you're selling the business, you can actually keep focusing on running the business. And so also what you don't want to happen is let's say you're doing, uh, let's start a, a million dollars in sales. And then you, you're trying to sell the business yourself. And because you're spending all this time selling the business, your sales go down because right. you're not selling right. as much. And as a result, your company is now worth less money. So yeah. when you finally get, you finally, after six months, find a buyer, they say, okay, well, I was going to be going to pay $5 million, but look, your sales are declining. I'm only willing to pay $3 million. And you just lost millions of dollars because you did the sales process. So it, the biggest mistake is to try to do it yourself. Yes. It's just, it's just, you cannot do it. It's not, it, it's so much more complex than selling a house. There's right. so many moving parts. Um, so, you know, you just need to outsource this to the professionals that that's what they do for a living. And once again, make sure they're aggressive professionals that are on the same page as you to try to get the highest price for your business and the best deal terms. Just doing a brief recap here, finding opportunities to replace yourself from the business, right. getting serious with your standard operating procedures, bringing your talent up, teaching them, training them, making sure you can stress test this, take a month off and uh, see where the holes are. When you get into the negotiation process, definitely make sure you're creating a marketplace and not just negotiating mm -hmm. with one buyer because you need leverage to get the max, making sure that you're enrolling a professional service provider and being open to structuring the deal that can give you the best terms and try to have as much control on the earnout metrics as possible. When is the best time to get started on this process? If you're considering selling anytime now in the next 10 years, today's the best time because I'm not saying you need to sell today, but making yourself irreplaceable is something you should do very, very quickly because you need to do that so you can work on the business and, and start gro really growing the business. That's something that you can work on. And also, as we talked about a couple minutes ago, things happen. Yes. And if you get six accident, you, you want to make sure that the business is protected from that. So that, that process, you want to start right away. If you want to sell the business, I, I would call it a year. I would say if I'm interested in selling the business in a year, I would start now. I would give myself a 12 month run rate because it does take time for the process to work. And the biggest mistake is to say, I need to sell in three months because you cannot create a competitive landscape in, yeah. in, in competitive marketplace in three months. So I would say if you're start working on being irreplaceable and the other issues today, regardless of, of when you want to sell, but when you think that possibly a year or so from now, I want to sell, I want to start doing that work on it now. But there, there are other things that we didn't talk about, like diversifying your customer base, 
that are really important to do immediately. So like, I think you should always be preparing to sell your business. Always. So like diversifying your customer base. If you have three customers that represent 80% of your business, very few people are going to want to buy your, 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 your business because it's too risky. So things like diversifying your customer base is something that I want to, you know, you need to start doing immediately for any business, you know, to, to lower the risk profile. Yeah. So, so that's a good point. Um, as we bring this thing to a close, let's talk about some honorable mentions. We, we talked about some big critical mistakes here, but you did mention uh, diversifying your customer base. Are there two or three other honorable mentions here for the critical mistakes that folks make? Sure. One is continuity programs, memberships, continuity programs, or even contracts with clients to buy certain amounts of products or services. Because the buyer in general is purchasing the ongoing revenues of, of your company. And if your company is every month starts at zero in sales and you got to fight to get sales, well, that's not nearly as valuable as a company that already has contracts or continuity programs where they have thousand cost customers paying hundred thousand dollars a month and they know their revenue is going to be hundred thousand. Oh, well, maybe they get a 2% churn. So it's 98,000, but you know, by having those continuity programs, membership programs, sign contracts to buy a certain amounts of products or services, you decrease the risk profile dramatically of your business. So that, that that's clearly an honorable mention. And then I always talk about identifying and building your, your value drivers. What are the value drivers? What are the things that competitors are going to find valuable about your, your, your company? Why would they want to buy it? So is it your technology? If it's your technology, build more of it. If it is it your customer base? To get more customers, diversify more. You know, what is it? If, if it's your people, hire more people and train them. If it's your systems, build more systems. Figure out what what the acquirers want. What is driving their value? What is driving the value of your company? And build more of that. I love it. Continuity program. So you get that recurring revenue and the right. value drivers, because this is what's essentially going to be the bell of the ball when you hit the marketplace. People are going to say, oh, I can finally buy that thing. I've wanted it for so long. I've been a competitor. They have the systems that I'm lacking. I could just buy them and acquire them. Uh, I love it so much. Dave, uh, thank you for joining the show. How do folks get a hold of you? The best way is, is to the growthink.com or growthinkcapital.com website. It's just, uh, there's, there's forms there. It gets right to me. Okay, you got it. Well, we will put your contact. Uh, we'll put the link in the show notes. And folks can also find you on LinkedIn and look for Dave Levinsky. He also has an amazing book, Start at the End. So check it out. Dave, appreciate thanks. It. Thanks, Tim. Great, great, uh, great speaking to you. I appreciate it as well. Thanks for having me.